to start, Brandon talks about the history and philosophy of Aikido. My name is Brandon Williams Craig. Um, I teach Aikido um, at Aikido of Berkeley and in Golden Bears Aikido at UC Berkeley. Um, I guess we're in Aikido at Berkeley right now. This is Dojo of Kayla Fader Sensei, who's my teacher. Um, and I have uh, a project in downtown Berkeley called Free Aiki Dojo that when we're training off campus, um, lives in this dojo and uses its facilities. And I thought I'd give a brief introduction to Aikido, or at least how I think about it. Um, on your right, these characters are Aikido. Um, combined, they mean something along the lines of the way of harmonizing spirit, or the spirit of harmonizing things, or along those lines. This person is Morihei Ueshiba. We call him O-sensei. He's the founder of the art. He died in April 1969. So Aikido is a relatively modern martial art. Um, its development um, was in the middle of the 20th century was during some of the most uh, profound, dis destructive uh, warfare that the world had ever known, the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And the founder's express purpose was to offer, in the context of a martial art, a way of, in his words, reconciling the world or changing the way conflict works from being about defeating an enemy or enemies to uh, unplugging conflict itself so that fighting got understood as moving towards something mysterious in which everyone could get what they need and a little of what they want rather than uh, power staying with the strongest and the strongest using that power to oppress them. So Aikido is a way of harmonizing spirit. Next, Brandon covers nomenclature and basic moves. So in introducing uh, videos about Aikido, uh, one of the uh, most important sets of information is a little bit of a co context about uh, how we move and what we call things. In general, uh, the Japanese names for techniques fall into two categories. There are numbers, which are arbitrary, the first technique, the second technique, the third technique. Um, and then there are names, which are all, almost all descriptive. Uh, whereas in a lot of Chinese martial arts, something will be named uh, Crouching Willow or something like that. Um, in Japanese, um, the technique names that have come down to us are mostly descriptions. Um, one hand grabs the wrist on the right side, that sort of thing. Um, so when you hear uh, numbers, um, in counting Aikido techniques, it will sound like each, ni, san, shi, go, rok, shich, hach, ku, ju, uh, and then begins to repeat going up from there. And um, the names of the attacks are things like uh, katate dori, which is one hand grabs one wrist on one side, or kata dori, one hand grabs one shoulder on one side, or shomen, uchi, meaning front strike, shomen, just like the um, the picture and the calligraphy you saw me standing in front of before is the shomen, the front of the dojo. Uh, uchi being strike, so shomen uchi is a strike to the front of the head. Yokomen uchi is a, is a strike to the side of the head. It comes straight up and then comes to something like an angle, kind of like a curveball in baseball. It looks like it's going to be this way, but then it goes that way. Uh, and there are all these names that are descriptive, basically. Um, the base of Aikido, since it is a jujitsu, um, probably most closely aligned to Daito Ryu Jiu Jitsu, but also to Shinto Yoshin Ryu Jiu Jitsu, um, is the, the keeping of one's balance and the structure of one's body and then moving that structure without losing one's balance. So some of the basic principles are Shise, which refers to posture, Kuzushi, which is taking, up, taking someone's balance, and um, Aiki, or blending. Uh, blending is also Awase. But um, what we're going to start with is um, what draws a lot of people um, to the art, which is uh, the keeping of balance, literally, um, and not necessarily emotionally in this regard. But um, I want to keep my knees over my toes. Um, and there are several themes, I'll say, that are all cumulative. So you practice them one at a time, but then you're expected to do them all at the same time when you're executing complex technique. So my knees will be bent over my toes, my head will be lifting up as though there were a string in the middle of my crown lifting up, my chin goes toward my chest just a little bit, and my eyes focus on the horizon, and they're soft focused. Now I'm looking directly at the camera, now I'm soft focused to take in as much information as I can, so I see information, not a particular thing. So knees bent over toes, head lifting up, chin down, eyes at the horizon, soft focused. 
Then I, I pay attention to my breathing. Uh, I want to breathe generously so that my body gets the message that all is well and my, my, and my mind is oxygenated. I have, lots of, I have what I need and my body gets the message that all is well. It has plenty. So I'm breathing deeply into my belly. Instead of my shoulders going up and down, my belly goes in and out and my body fills with energy as a condition. That's part of what ki means. The uh, I ki do, the central character, refers to an image of steam coming up from rice uh, as if there's uh, various metaphors are applied. At any rate, the balance is maintained as we move by opening and closing the hips like a hinge. So, for instance, if I put all my weight on my left foot, I can move my right foot without my head moving around indicating that I've lost my balance. So I'll open and close my right hip with all the weight in my left, and then once I've prepared the new foot, I'll pull myself toward it, and then my back foot is free, and I can move it without my head wobbling. So uh, one of the tests of balance is that you'll move back and forth between your feet. And when you shuttle, you'll float a foot to check and see if really you have your balance. If your feet are too widely spaced, when you go forward, your head will have to tip for you to be able to lift your foot. And unless you're doing it on purpose, that's probably a balance loss. So we open and close our hips like hinges. And then when we move, we do so in very specific ways. And there are lots of ways to move, but these are some basic ones. We call them Thai Sabaki which roughly means body management. Uh, a pivot, for instance, would leave my, we my um, weight in my back foot, I'd close my front hip, I'd place it where I want it, and then i take the knee, take it over the toe as I invest that side with weight, and by doing so, it changes my orientation. I then open my other hip, and I'm facing the opposite direction, so I pivoted. Our hands and feet always match. That's another good theme in Aikido, is that rather than um, our hands being in opposition like you would when you're walking. Um, they'll stay together so that when one side of your body moves, your hand moves in coordination with it. So a pivot looks like you're not looking like this. Um, a moving pivot is uh, as an entrance, you're going into something, and so the word used to refer to it is ev mean, which means entering. So I exaggerate almost as though I were going to side kick, and then I move in and, with, and draw my foot along with me. So I'm entering, traveled, here you mean. Uh, another basic movement is called tenkan, which means body turning. And I close the front hip as though I were going to pivot, and then I sweep the back foot. And then I adjust the front foot in order to be comfortable. And I change my entire body weight uh, with my hands aligned with my hips so that anyone attached to me would have been pulled by my whole body weight around in a circle. That's called tenkan. Um, there's right and left side stepping, sounds fairly simple. You move your foot to the side and then you change in that direction. All my weight's in my front, I move my foot to the side almost as though I were kicking from the hip, and then I adjust by bringing the back foot. The basic stance um, we, we adopt is called hanmi. It means basically half body. Whereas uh, a horse stance, for instance, from karate is square, and you're delivering your power in that way. Aikido stands as though we were afraid of being shot with an arrow or struck by something. So instead of being square, I um, am on the angle a lot. It's though my back foot with the back of a triangle and the point comes in front of my foot in front. Uh, so let's see, we've done sidestepping, we've done pivoting, we've done irimi, which is a traveling pivot, we've done tenkan, which closes the front and sweeps the back. Uh, two steps are also important. If you leave your front foot so you don't telegraph your movement and you close your back hip across you, and then invest the front with knee with weight, which turns you in the same way that you would punch, you've then completed a closed two-step. I don't allow my partner to, to know that I'm going to move by opening or changing anything. I just close and turn. And I, I turn on a dime, so to speak. And then an open two-step allows you to take more space. You open the front hip and the front knee and the front toe, and then you take your, and your hands and, and um, feet, again, remain uh, parallel. Close two-step, open two-step. And these are basic Aikido movements, and there are several more. These are the ones we practice over and over again as our basic. Here, Brandon talks about the weapons used in Aikido. Okay. Aikido uses two um, weapons, basically. They're practice weapons. They're made of wood. 
One is uh, modeled on the Japanese samurai sword, katana. This is called a boken, or practice sword. Um, it's about um, hip height. Um, we also use a walking stick um, called the jo, which is about as high as your armpit. And um, since we are not a sword style, and we are not about fighting with sticks necessarily, what these are about is changing the way your body moves. Um, for instance, jiu-jitsu traditionally are based on um, weapon use and retention. And so um, what the samurai wanted to do is deploy his weapons as quickly as possible, and then keep them. And so um, a lot of Aikido techniques are, are predicated on having your hands close together in front of your hips, because that's where your greatest pounds per square inch are delivered. If you were going to lift a bowling ball, you wouldn't lift it over here, you'd lift it right here. If you really wanted to smash something, you'd smash right in front of you. And as a result of body structure, that's what happens. Same thing is true of delivering a PSI when you're trying to fight somebody. And so uh, we use the bulking, uh, the practice sword, to get in the habit of having our shoulders relaxed and the muscles in our arms only engaged to support the structure rather than being used um, to throw somebody. So it's where you are and the structure you maintain that has someone else fall down. It's not what you can do them with your strength. Uh, and we use uh, bulking to get our body in line so that we can tell if our hips are engaged um, and our feet are in the right place to keep our balance as we move in a relaxed way. Uh, like, likewise, the Joe, uh, and we, we learn individual exercises um, and kata and partner practices that are based on hip movement and hand placement. And this is the Joe. Bulkin, Joe. Now Brandon tells us how to fall and roll without being hurt. So one of the first important things in Aikido, uh, in order to be able to feel what a throw feels like, you have to be able to fall without being hurt. So Aikido uses uh, a lot of falling in order to learn the throwing. Um, one of the great things about Aikido is that um, we work with another person um, face to face, grabbing onto each other and throwing each other completely, which is different from a lot of martial arts that do a lot of kata by themselves or um, pull punches and things like that, so you don't really get to feel the full impact of what you do. Um, Aikido, uh, we train um, all the way to the ground, every throw, pretty much, um, almost every time, with lots of people of different size, so we have to learn to fall. The basic principles of falling uh, take the alignment that we learned while we were standing and take it to the ground. So one vertical line of balance when we were standing, which makes you posture, um, is what makes falling possible. But instead of my head going forward, which is how most falls happen when you don't, when you haven't learned how to fall, um, in an unpracticed fall, the head goes pretty much straight between the hips and hits the ground. What we're interested in doing is establishing a new vertical line from the down hip to the opposite shoulder. Then the equilateral triangle that's made um, by your nose coming down when you bow with your knees equidistant apart. My nose uh, makes the tip of that equilateral triangle with my knees. That's where I'm going to put my shoulder when I do a roll. And I'm going to take my head to the side to get my spine and my head out of danger. And then I push with my feet. Um, I make a my body is round. And the other major Aikido principle that's really important to start off with from day one is you're using your center to generate all of your energy and all of your technique. So that's also true in rolling. So it's the middle, it's the core muscles that join your lower body to your upper body that are informing how your structure holds you in space. And it's that structure that keeps you safe as you roll, not strength of arms or strength of legs or any particular part. It's everything working together. So you end up round and you choose a safer shoulder to hip transit for your roll rather than some, a somersault, for instance, head to your coccyx. So you're at an angle like that. So what I've just shown you is rolling from seiza, or seated, with my, my feet underneath my hips. Um, so the hip. challenge in um, ukemi, in falling, is in keeping yourself together, motivated by your center as you move from the floor to standing, back to the floor again, and back to standing again, so that it's a smooth process in which no part of you ever takes all the weight of your body. So as we um, roll from seiza, sitting, forward and back, 
we then need to uh, graduate until we can move from being all the way on the floor to being all the way standing. So what I ask my students to do next is crouch, and it looks something like this. I have them have both knees off the floor, uh, because protecting the knees is really important. That's one of the main injuries in Aikido is knees. Um, and so we're crouching, and you make a circle with your body so that you're uh, a ball shape. And then you make sure that that shoulder that's going to that's gonna hit the ground uh, instead of your head is farther. And then you keep your body together in a round shape, and you roll to a crouch on the other side, thereby establishing your, your posture again with that one vertical line of balance lifting up. And you can go forward and back. Now, one of the differences in the way that I fall from the way it's rest of the Aikido world, more or less, is I use my toes all the time, rather than using the flat of my foot. Um, so I can always spring up or go back down again because I have my toes underneath me. Then, when you've done the crouch, um, the next phase is standing. So, all together, if we were to show the levels, we would start from Seiza. Roll to a crouch, my knees off the ground. And then back to standing. And then back to a crouch. And then back to Seiza. That way we've gone all the way from the ground to standing and back again. Finally, Brandon describes how to maintain balance when working with a partner. This is tile. This is an illustration of how Tai Sabaki, or body management, is used in making Aikido throws happen. Um, what I'm interested in is keeping my, my vertical uh, line of balance and moving myself so that I don't overbalance myself. Um, so I'm going to connect with him by extending into my arm, but without pushing into him, which might take my balance forward or letting my arm collapse, which will allow him to push me backwards. What instead I want to do is make a, a slight connection to him so that he doesn't go anywhere, but that his body wonders what's going on. And then I keep keeping my balance, I get out of the way of whatever his second attack will be, and I move behind him, dropping his balance. I started up this high, and I, because I take long steps, I end up lower, and my knees bend. So I start here, and I end there, and I zigzag out of the way of whatever his second attack will be. And as a result, since he's a biped, he falls down into his third point, where if he were a kangaroo, for instance, he would have a tail behind him. That's where he will fall because he doesn't have anything to support him. So when he grabs onto my wrist, I go out of the way of what's going to be his second attack, keeping my body together, and in, and down. I showed Tenkan a little while ago. Imagine that I wanted to um, move him, but without wrestling with him. Where his hand um, and his center work together are right in front. He has a front third point as well as a back third point, which I just demonstrated. So I can step in, keeping my hand same distance from my belly, by extending it, and then rotate my other foot out of the way. It's an exercise. I'm checking to see whether I can keep my balance or not while I take his, while my head lifts up. Irimi. My feet are just doing this, which puts me right behind him with my feet matching his. Then I can move him with my body him around, and my hand comes back up my center, and it all has to do with the movement of the body. So it's not my arms, I don't hit him with anything, I move his body to the point, like a base being pushed off a shelf, but there's nothing underneath, and down his body goes. It's not me throwing him, it's me structuring things so that he has nothing that will hold him up. I shot this video here at Aikido of Berkeley. 1514 University Avenue, just southeast of Sacramento. Come by and learn the art of peace. Everyone welcome.